Hello, good friends. Uh, good friends of uh, artificial intelligence, general artificial intelligence, and Sbeer and AI journey. Welcome to uh, artificial intelligence journey. And we start our discussion panel on can machines think. Um, we, we believe that uh, for this year, um, the famous article of Alan Turing, uh, published in Mind Journal in October 1950, um, which started actually the whole uh, artificial intelligence journey. So it's a good, uh, good um, reason to discuss what is done on 70 years of artificial intelligence. And today with us a uh, few uh, best in the world experts on artificial intelligence and uh, on uh, information technologies. So first of all, um, you will hear from Gurdjieff Pau, corporate vice president of Microsoft, Microsoft Research, and our long time partner with whom we did uh, not only one research project, and uh, we are happy that uh, Gurdip uh, will join us for artificial intelligence journey. Uh, everybody of you, actually, who is a little bit older than 35, are familiar with Gurdip uh, because if you know Windows NT and if you know uh, VPN, so, uh, then you know uh, some of his products which he developed while he's quite a long stay at Microsoft, almost 30 years. Uh, so some of you are younger than uh, Gurdip is working for Microsoft. So Gurdip uh, is inventor of um, Windows, in, at least part of Windows NT. Uh, Gurdip is inventor of one of the first VPNs and stand um, in the beginning of the Internet era, uh, Windows era, and now artificial intelligence era. Uh, so Gurdip, please, um, what is allure of uh, thinking machine? Please. Hello, everyone. Uh, firstly, I'd like to start by uh, thanking Albert for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to talk to you about uh, one of my favorite topics, um, which is uh, really in the artificial intelligence uh, space. Uh, I'm joining you here from uh, the Turing Room, which is uh, in the Microsoft Research Building, Microsoft Campus in Seattle area. So, you know, the topic of uh, thinking machines is a, is a, has been a fascination, uh, you know, for a very long time. Uh, I thought I would start with the, the intelligence in life itself. Now, you know, the Earth is about 4.6 billion years old. About 500 million years ago, uh, something very interesting happened. Um, at that time, all the life was living inside the oceans. The oceans had very low oxygen levels. But around 500 million years ago, uh, there's what is something sometimes referred to as the Cambrian explosion or the Cambrian acceleration happened, where life suddenly got more intelligent. And scientists are still you know, arguing about what is, why that happened. Um, but um, the main thing which happened, the few things which happened at the time which we know is that number one, the oxygen level um, in the oceans went up. It went from about two to 3% to about 10%. Uh, another thing which happened, uh, scientists believe that the developmental genes uh, developed through mutations which allowed the regulation of how uh, creatures were able to, um, you know, control their basic genetic uh, processes. But the most interesting explanation to me is that it was about 500 million years ago that the complex eye structure uh, was developed in creatures. And that was a very, very interesting development because once the creatures could see, they could find food easily, they could avoid predators, and they could actually go after other creatures. And that allowed much more complex organisms, organisms to be built. I think it's good to remember this uh, as we think about artificial intelligence moving forward. Now, after the 500 million years uh, ago, uh, the first documented idea of artificial intelligence was provided by none other than Homer himself from around 8th century BC um, 
8th to 12th century BC is sort of the time when, you know, a lot of his writings are attributed. And he talked about in the Iliad how this, uh, the lame god Hephaestus actually uh, was talking about different kinds of robots around him to help him in his life. Uh, one were these tripods with wheels. Then there were these robots which are shaped like, uh, like, uh, uh, like uh, the female form uh, who were helping him with lots of things uh, that Homer was, uh, what Hephaestus was trying to accomplish. After Homer's writing, um, the next significant piece of thought in the area of artificial intelligence is attributed to Ramon Lull, who was a philosopher and a thinker, uh, a Catalan region of Spain. Um, Ramon Lull uh, actually came up with the idea. In fact, he had invented a kind of a seven disc rotating system where the, each seven discs had different kinds of concepts. And he basically said that if you rotate the different combinations of these discs, you can pretty much contain all the uh, ideas and concepts around, you know, that, that humans exhibit. And it was, it was a very, very interesting, uh, you know, idea um, that inspired just a lot of thinking actually centuries later. You know, it was, you know, William Gottfried, uh, Gottfried Wilhelm uh, Leibniz in the 17th century who then took that idea to create to create uh, uh, perhaps even a more developed system uh, in which he created sort of this alphabet of thought and he wanted to sort of create this computation of ideas um, and he sort of furthered that cause. You know, after that, of course, uh, why we are uh, gathered here today, uh, you know, this Alan Turing sort of seminal paper on can machines think. You know, in that paper, uh, Alan Turing did a couple of things. I think number one, uh, really created, really formulated uh, this, how to even think about this idea of artificial intelligence by having this so-called Turing test. Uh, but also, you know, I thought the the work, his his uh, taking the different arguments and and really sort of you know playing them out. I thought that was incredible work, and it was also very telling uh, towards the end of that paper when he talks about things like telepathy and so on, um, uh, which sort of uh, you know he he kind of created this sort of very open ended aspect to artificial intelligence, which I think is something that we should all keep in mind as we move forward. The last 70 years have been uh, quite interesting in the artificial intelligence journey. You know, of course, it started off with a lot of the rules-based thinking, uh, a lot of the symbolic systems uh, that, that people worked with, expert systems. Um, and, you know, while that gave some pretty early uh, sort of uh, off the races, uh, we found that that sort of thinking you know, ran out of steam, and we ended up with this AI winter until some of the data-driven approaches started to show promise. But it was only in the last decade that we saw the neural nets make comeback, uh, thanks to you know a lot more computing power and a lot more digitized data being available. Um, and we are starting to see some really, really incredible progress in the last 10 years. Um, now, if you take a step back from this uh, this journey in the last 70 years, you will find there is about three different schools of thought uh, which represent these cognitive metaphors. You know, you have the connectionists who are really trying to model, uh, you know, intelligence in the sort of this, this graph form, you know, with these... Uh, these units which are connected to other units and it's through this composite uh, 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 analysis you're able to find, you're able to sort of emulate intelligence. Uh, then you have the symbolists who um, were, I would say, have tried to, um, you know, sort of latch onto the idea that humans think in certain concepts and humans uh, think in certain uh, building blocks of knowledge. and the best thing for us to do is to really emulate that uh, inside a computing system. And you can build, you know, the different layers of intelligence just based on that particular idea. And then there are the probably the lesser known dynamicists, you know, who believe that these dynamical systems can be best modeled with things like differential equations and so on. And what we've seen in the last 70 years is, you know, these different cognitive metaphors sort of 
you know, taking the lead, uh, pushing forward until they hit some walls. And then, you know, we, we take, we stall for a while and we go pick up the other idea and we run with it. But generally, you know, you can classify all the work so far in these three sort of uh, buckets. Now, let's talk about the connectionists who are really having their day in the sun, as it were, um, with the resurgence of, uh, of neural networks and with deep learning. Now, the core construct there is really uh, the construct of the neuron, which, as you see, you know, there is a biological neuron uh, inside the human brain. Um, so said, well, you know, how about we create an artificial neuron, which actually is very simple when it comes to sort of the mathematical operation that it does. Um, and, you know, with the activation of that particular neuron, recognizing that it has already been proven that the biological neuron is much more superior than the artificial neuron that we envision today. Uh, one simple example of that is that in a, a single biological neuron has been shown to exhibit um, nonlinear uh, capability. For example, if you have to take the XOR function and you have to do it in, with, with artificial neurons, you will need at least two layers, uh, but it can actually be done in one, in one new, uh, biological neuron. Now, taking this basic idea of, of a artificial neuron, of course, we create uh, neural networks. Uh, in the same way there are biological networks in the human brain, uh, we create artificial neuron uh, neural networks. And it is, again, through similar kind of a connectivity of, of these different neurons, uh, through which in biology is with synapse. Here it is uh, connections between the layers of the neurons. And you know, in the last 10 years uh, or so, some of this is little predates that, uh, we've seen just a tremendous amount of uh, deep learning architectures uh, for specialized tasks starting to emerge. And some of these are actually inspired by biology. In fact, if you look at a lot of the work in computer vision, uh, not only, you know, it was inspired by biology, it is now explaining uh, human biology uh, when it comes to computer vision and some of the processes that we see in the, the visual cortex. Uh, similarly, you know, some of the work, uh, you know, with uh, with memory-based architectures, whether it be, you know, LSTM, um, uh, etc., are starting to really, you know, um, get very, very specialized, um, you know, really taking some inspiration from biology. Um, thanks to the progress in deep learning, we have seen some amazing breakthroughs in the last five years. Now, all the breakthroughs that I show to you on the slide here all happened in Microsoft Research. Uh, everything from um, the ability to um, have speech recognition at a, at a level that is better than humans, the ability to detect objects better than humans, machine reading and comprehension where uh, the AI model reads a corpus of text and is able to answer questions based on that, captioning of video things, all these have happened just actually in the last four to five years. And these milestones in Microsoft Research, of course, tremendous amount of progress has been made globally in the industry, uh, not just in Microsoft Research, but this is just a glimpse to show you how much progress we have made. Now, none of these tests actually would qualify as a Turing test uh, by definition, because the Turing test basically, you know, said you could ask a question, you could ask uh, the, the entity, um, something that you know could be outside of the domain that these models are perfected for but regardless you know they they represent significant progress but also the significant limitations of the progress that has been made so before we talk about you know some of the uh, you know the limitations i want to talk about the gpt3 model which uh, i'm sure that you've heard about uh, this is the work that has been done by OpenAI. Um, this year, um, um, you know, they announced GPT-3, which can be called the grandmaster of language models. Uh, it is a generative model using some of the transformer architectures that have been perfected. Uh, it is incredible. Uh, the, 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 the kind of uh, results that we are able to see with GPT-3 um, you know, you could say they're language results, but actually many of them are fact-based results as well, because this thing was trained on about 5 billion tokens of data, and it has 175 billion parameters. 
which is you know absolutely uh, incredible and you could say that you know sort of underlines the fact that the deep learning based approaches really became possible because we had this incredible amount of compute that we could bring to bear and also incredible amounts of digitized data uh, this gpt3 uh, has uh, in addition to you know of course uh, you know being able to write uh, different kinds of long form text it is being used for many 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 applications largely in the language domain uh, for example you know there are uh, uh, already applications for writing uh, python code uh, there are applications for automatically generating emails uh, there are applications where you know there are plugins where uh, you can automatically uh, fill out excel data um, etc which have all been written on top of the gpt3 model um, which has been very 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 impressive i think if you have to look at the progress of ai today you have to use this as where we are 70 years after uh, alan turing's paper and said so this marks probably the most significant progress you know we are very uh, happy to be working with open ai at, at microsoft uh, we have a deep strategic partnership with them and, and a lot of this work happened on the azure uh, platform itself so okay great progress but but we also have lots of lots of limitations uh, i'll talk about some of them which i have listed here well number one you know the amount of data required to train these models is just i mean it's just really really too much uh, for us to get this level of performance and we know that you know humans are able to do uh, very well without using that much data the models themselves are opaque you know all the learning itself itself is sort of encoded in in these in these multi-dimensional vectors um you know which is which no one can make sense of um we have this problem which humans don't have which is that these models are used for training offline and then you know they're used for inference uh, when they are being used but there isn't this notion of continuous learning in most cases um, you know there is no semantic understanding i'm going to talk about some examples on that uh, the power required to train these models is is incredible uh, you know estimations on gpt3 which i have read uh, on the on the on the web uh, you know take us into megawatts of power uh, for training these uh, these uh, models while the human brain you know seems to do fine with about 20 watts of power uh, that it sort of runs in um, so there are many uh, many different uh, limitations you know um, all these models are trained for fairly narrow set of tasks though with gpt3 we are starting to see that change uh, you know these are multitask uh, uh, models can be built on top of the single representation that is learned uh, which is which is quite impressive so you can see you know we've made a lot of progress in the 70 years but there are so many other hard things that we need to solve for, um, you know, including causal causal reasoning. <clears throat> so I, I talked, you know, how powerful the GPT-3 model is, but it is also has lots of limitations, which kind of highlights the point I was making about the kind of limitations that exist today, even with the best models. If you ask GPT-3, uh, which is heavier, a toaster or a pencil? It says a pencil is heavier than a toaster. And you ask it like when counting what number comes before 10,000, it says 9,099 comes before 10,000. Then you ask like who was the president of the United States in 1700? It says William Penn was the president of the United States in 1700. Okay, well, let's examine these three questions. Well, the first reason, the first uh, answer it got wrong about pencil being heavier was because in all the 5 billion tokens of text that were there, nowhere it had actually had a direct reference to the weight of a pencil and a toaster. So it got it wrong. When it comes to counting, it actually does not have an underlying idea of mathematics, which is a very important point. That's the semantic understanding part. It, it, therefore, it basically tries to find a close answer and gives it, it turns out to be wrong. In the third case, uh, you know, this was a bit of a trick question because United States did not exist in 1700, but it made up an answer uh, because it, you know, it thought 
you know, I'm going to take some famous people from the 1700 period of time uh, in this area. And they basically, and basically came up with an answer, basically telling you that while we have made a lot of progress on some very fundamental things that you could probably see if you ask a maybe a, a nine year old kid uh, and ask the answer to these questions, they will probably get these answers right, which this amazing model could not get right. Now, Marvin Minsky, who you know can be called uh, one of the elders of uh, of artificial intelligence, in 1970, you know, said that in three to eight years we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. You know, this was 50 years ago. Uh, so, you know, predicting when we will have the average, uh, the intelligence of an average human being, uh, is is a very, very difficult task. If Marvin Minsky got it wrong, uh, you know, many of us will probably get it wrong if we try to predict it. Um, so it was very interesting uh, for me to read another prediction by the Turing Award winner this year, uh, Jeffrey Hinton, who's considered as one of the three, uh, I would say, the fathers of, uh, of deep learning movement, um, you know, who, who made a statement, uh, deep learning will be able to do everything. Which made me, you know, think, um, um, you know, like, could this be true? And I came to the conclusion that it is, it is, he's probably right. And for one very, very fundamental reason is that deep learning has given us a, an approach which allows us to, to do function approximation uh, better than we have ever been able to do. Now, the place where I feel, you know, his statement is uh, is ambiguous, um, and maybe it was intentionally so, is that I believe that some of the, the approaches that are going to be needed to get to artificial general intelligence are going to be um, a lot more coming from the from the uh, the symbolists and the dynamicists uh, world as well, even though some of their ideas may be solved best with some of the deep learning approaches that are there. So, uh, you know, that's kind of where I see things going. Um, I feel that if you look at, uh, you know, where do we need to make tremendous amounts of progress uh, if we are going to, you know, get to the sort of the human level of intelligence, uh, number one, I think, model-based notions of space, time, and physics. I mean, this can also be called common sense. Uh, you know, a little child doesn't need to learn uh, that, you know, if you throw an uh, uh, object they've never seen before up in the, in the you know, uh, up in the air, what's going to happen to that object? Um, and, you know, they certainly have notions of time. They have notions of space. Uh, these are fundamental ideas that somehow needs to be encoded uh, into all the approaches for AI that we have. Um, I think knowledge representation, we are starting to make really good progress, uh, you know, certainly on the language side. But I think this needs to expand uh, into numbers, into graphs, into you know pretty much how humans uh, you know have this notion of knowledge that we, we sort of keep, we, we acquire and we we organize. Uh, I think reinforcement learning I think is a very very important uh, maybe coming more from the dynamicists uh, sort of side. I think it's a very very important discipline um, largely because if you look at how. Uh, how ch children, uh, humans uh, learn, uh, and a lot of those approaches can be uh, considered as reinforcement learning, though I would say it is also, you know, online reinforcement learning is probably a better way to say it. I think causal inference work is critical. Um, you know, today, artificial intelligence uh, work is completely devoid of causal inference, uh, at least as we know it today, the work that Judia Perlman, uh, Judia Pearl has been driving has been, uh, you know, I think really amazing. It'll be great to see a lot more people focused on that. And then lastly, I put in sparse learning because I think that, uh, you know, this power hungry approach to building these uh, really, really deep and uh, uh, high parameterized models is, is not sustainable from an energy perspective. Um, you know, it, so we, I think sparse learning is pretty much, you know, how human brains also actually uh, uh, operate, I think is something that needs a lot more attention. We started to see some, some really interesting work here. But lastly, I would say, 
I think if we are going to make a progress and towards a truly thinking machine, it will require the connectionist symbol, the symbolists, and the dynamicists to all come together, and perhaps using some of the constructs that we've got from deep learning um, to solve the problems. You know, for example, if you look at the symbolists, you know they their their entire uh, uh, thinking is based on the idea of symbols um, that are really used to construct you know all the different layers uh, above it but symbols you know don't necessarily have to be symbols that humans also recognize and i think this is a very important insight uh, in fact you could argue that some of the breakthroughs in gpt3 which came through the representation in the latent, latent space uh, with with vectors you could say they are symbols. It's just that we just don't recognize them. Uh, similarly, you know, deep reinforcement learning, uh, you know, neural ODE work. Uh, this is how you know we are seeing how deep learning is even uh, helping uh, the classical disciplines like you know how do you solve differential equations or build system, how do you uh, build models uh, based on differential equations, except using the neural approaches. So I think. This is where we are. I think if these three disciplines work together, uh, we will have a truly thinking machine, um, hopefully in our lifetimes. Thank you very much. So we keep our discussion panel uh, during 70 years of publishing Mind article. Uh, right now, uh, besides Gurdi Pau, who is temporarily um, out of uh, connection, I would like to introduce our other guests who are joining our panel. Uh, our first guest is uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Leonid Zhukov, who is the head of Artificial Intelligence Laboratory in Zber, and, uh, well, uh, our closest collaborator on many fields of artificial intelligence, which is running here, and you can learn about activities of his laboratory, I think, everywhere at this conference. Uh, Dr. Leonid Zhukov uh, joined Sberbank quite recently from High School of Economics, where he was uh, uh, one of the head of faculties for computer science and artificial intelligence. So uh, we are very happy to welcome Leonid in um, Sber and uh, research and development uh, blog for Sber. Also, today you already heard Michael Woodridge. Uh, professor from Oxford University, computer science department, head of computer science department. And uh, Michael is uh, author of a wonderful book, best book uh, of the year by Financial Times. And uh, I'm very proud that I read it from uh, cover to the end of the book. And uh, please um, buy this book at Amazon or maybe it's their shop uh, because it's really worth reading and it's uh, not um, uh, not a chance that it's the really best book of the year. Uh, so, but before discussing with uh, Gurdip, with Michael, with Leonid uh, Turing 70, Can Machine Think, um, I thought that I need uh, to give a context uh, of uh, our discussion because this is really important. Uh, probably I forgot to introduce myself for those who are not really familiar with me, but maybe some of you, at least my students, are, might be familiar with you. My name is Abut Efimov. Uh, I am uh, working in Sber uh, more than three years, and now I'm heading R&D uh, blog for whole Sber uh, with uh, vice president title. I, I wear many hats in my uh, career, uh, and uh, I would say I'm just amateur scientist and uh, R&D manager here in Sber, and trying to be very useful for everybody. So, uh, back to our topic. Uh, computing, machinery, and intelligence uh, was published first time 70 years ago. It's quite a long time. Many people uh, might remember uh, epoch where we have no computers. At least my uh, scientific advisor for my PhD uh, was born long ago before Turing uh, published his um, uh, thesis. Uh, but it's very important to look at the past because we uh, recall the past, it serves the present. Today, it gives us fresh insights on what we sometimes overlooked and calls our attention 
to ideas uh, that might be missed in uh, for for some reasons it might give us new perspectives and that's why we are looking for uh, new ideas 70 years passed since uh, Turing published this article in October 1950 so it really was discussing but first of all uh, let me remind you who was Alan Turing he was scientific prodigy uh, uh, some of his uh, friends in childhood called him scientific Shelley at the age of 14 at the age of 14 he ride the bike uh, 120 kilometers to his new school and next year he actually published a uh, small article dedicated to Einstein theory of relativity uh, at the picture here uh, at the drawing here you see uh, you see drawing by Turing ma mother, Sarah, and it's Alan playing game, uh, but he actually gave up game and just looking at how daisies grow. And this is all Alan Turing. He always did something contradictory to others. Later on his life, he was famous for very ugly trousers. Uh, uh, it was not uh, the fashion at the time in England. It was always, uh, uh, trousers should be always very, very uh, well ironed. And uh, Alan uh, was always uh, with wrong uh, trousers. So everybody actually paying attention to it. But he was still a uh, very much scientific uh, prodigy. And uh, very early he was elected as a fellow in King's College, uh, Cambridge and uh, publish a uh, paper uh, on computable numbers with application to Einstein problem, uh, which is problem of computability, uh, which got attention of Alonzo Church and he's got uh, his PhD visit to United States uh, to work uh, for his PhD uh, with Alonzo Church. He finished it, returns back to uh, Cambridge and actually come to Ludwig Wittgenstein to have some discussion on uh, intelligence and the foundation of mass with him. And as, as soon as uh, World War II broke, he joined government court in the Cypher School uh, as one of the leading coders, uh, court breakers there. Um, foundation of peace, uh, which we are enjoying right now, was uh, actually late at the time. <coughs> It was 1940 when he traveled in France uh, uh, during the war to meet with Polish crypto team. And uh, then he established the so-called uh, Hot A team, which helped actually uh, not win the war, but to save enormous amount of lives uh, for the fight of England and North Atlantic. Uh, in 1941, he breaks UCO transmissions and Bletchley Park, where he, Alan Turing was working, was reading all the messages asked instantly as German were typing them. In 1942, he created first automated machine to read German messages and it helped to defeat Germans in uh, North Africa. Uh, also at that time, he visited US again and meet Claude Shannon in Bell Labs. In 1943, he works on the first in the world speech encryption system in Bell Labs and then returns to United Kingdom, where he builds world's first electronic computer, Colossus, on the premises of Bletchley Park. I advise everybody of you uh, to visit Bletchley Park, which is now a museum and it's a very, very worst, uh, worst visit. 1945, he completes this speech encryption system, but there is no use for it because he celebrates V-Day in my, uh, 1945, this quiet walk with his friends, that's it. And then he immediately travels to Germany to study the cryptology as well as to deliver a lecture. Um, <clears throat> uh, this picture shows you uh, how it looks, uh, Bletchley Park at that time. Uh, it was uh, actually as the uh, head of Alan Turing. And after the war, uh, it was mentioned that uh, he was one of the founders of Racial Club, uh, which was founded in 1948, and it was very much multidisciplinary, and it was very much uh, dedicated to new ideas. So it says, um, you see that no professors, only young people were allowed, and Alan Turing was a kind of celebrity there. Uh, so, uh, a lot of new ideas were proposed during Croatia Club uh, his days, and he actually 
many many later ideas he developed uh, there. Uh, so in 1946 he uh, started develop uh, first uh, electronic calculators in NPL lab, which is in London. Uh, and also start running marathon, 30 kilometers. And uh, 1947, uh, he visit U.S. again, meet with um, uh, some uh, U.S. scientists, including uh, von Neumann. Uh, and his meeting for, with von Neumann was actually uh, laying foundation for the future study uh, of von Neumann himself uh, and von Neumann architecture. Uh, then after his, um, I would say, uh, not successful presentation to NPL, uh, National Physics Lab, he decided to move for Cambridge for sabbatical. Um, uh, one of his bosses at uh, NPL said on Turing report on artificial intelligence, first Turing report, that uh, it's a schoolboy essay and not suitable for publication. That's a very well-known fact in uh, Turing historians, and it's uh, actually it should be very much encouraging for all young scientists. Please keep uh, working and uh, don't be upset if old guys like me and somebody else are criticizing your ideas, uh, which you are presenting to them on internal workshops. So please, please be be uh, be ready for critics and not afraid of it. Um, and uh, in 1950, he writes the world's first uh, programming manual and then uh, complete uh, publishing uh, computing machinery and intelligence in Mind Journal. Mind Journal is a philosophical journal, and that's why Alan Turing uh, became father of I. At that year, he also bought a house in Manchester to be happy there. Um, now I come to Foundation of Life and Eternity. Uh, in 1951-52, he gives a few talks to BBC on artificial intelligence with some predictions. And then he switches to actually biology. And I think uh, he also published the first paper dedicated to uh, bioinformatics. So he might be also as well as uh, father of uh, bioinformatics. Um, Many, uh, many modern historians believe that due to accident, not suicide, but accident, he died at uh, June 7, uh, 1954, um, just a little bit not uh, living to his 42 uh, birthday. So he, uh, he left no death note, and um, many people believe that it was just a tra tragic accident. So uh, I strongly recommend you to, if you are willing to know more about Alan Turing, read this book, written to one of my good friends, Huma Shan and Kevin Barwick, as well as, of course, Mike uh, Woolwich book and some, some other books which are available uh, widely. Uh, so, uh, I have some, some uh, further ideas, but first, uh, first let, me, let me tell you two major things, uh, two major ideas which um, gave us Alan Turing. First is universal Turing machine, and second is Turing test, which uh, laid out a uh, foundation for computer functionalism. Uh, what is computer functionalism? Very simple idea. Uh, Descartes uh, believed that uh, 500 years ago that humans uh, are machines, might be machines, animals are machines. Uh, but uh, Turing and later uh, philosophers who created computer functionalism believed that uh, humans are machines with software. Uh, brains are hardware and software is running on them is uh, uh, what actually makes us humans. Uh, and he created Turing test, which probably many of uh, you heard of. Um, but uh, universal Turing machine, as well as very important one, um, his achievement, because every, every machine sooner or later become Turing machine. It means we have emulation of uh, everything possible with that simple Turing machine, which is actually going back and forth on the um, paper, uh, print, erase, and print again. That's it. Very simple algorithm, very simple machine, but it can emulate everything. So what we do, what Gurdip is doing, what Leonid is doing right now, is just make Turing machines a little bit faster. And that's it. 
we are I'm not doing anything more so uh uh, going go, going back to uh, Turing test is enormously popular. It's millions of mentions on Google. Um, it's um, a foundation of imitation game uh, where we can think on can, can machine think comes from this. Um, but we discussed it might be um, in more detail. And uh, I don't want to spend much time on uh, some of my slides. And I go to. I go to questions for our discussion, which are very important. And I see that my friend Gary Bratsky uh, also joined us. So we welcome uh, Gary to our discussion. Um, Gary Bratsky is a, uh, uh, well, I started with uh, from past. So he's uh, one of the leading members of the team which won DARPA Grand Challenge in 2005 and then uh, sold this team to Google. He later sold another startup to Google, and Gary, we are happy to it. And uh, Gary is famous for being a founder of OpenCV. And uh, Gary has got enormous amount of fans here in Moscow, in Russia, and actually every young man and uh, girl who are working on computer vision uh, start with OpenCV, which was developed uh, by Gary team already many years, 20 years ago, I think. Uh, something so uh, and uh, also Gary has got many uh, in interesting ideas on uh, what is uh, what are computers right now what is computer science and what is artificial intelligence so all together we have uh, four great experts uh, one of the world greatest experts and you see I'm like sh I don't understand what happened to me why I'm so lucky and happy uh, to have all you here at my panel and um, I put in front of you actually six questions you might, uh, you might see right now and read of them, but two questions are actually uh, most important for me right now. Uh, first question is, um, what was wrong for the last 70 years in search of artificial intelligence and thinking machine? Would be uh, chewing, uh, surprised if he come today at our conference and see what is going on and what he's surprised the most. And second important question, what should we do uh, to make our research, our policy uh, right for the next 70 years of research? Jürgen schmeckt Huber today was laying out picture of billions of years. Well, that's impressive, but let's not go that far. 70 years is just enough uh, for any predictions. What we should do right for next 70 years and what mistakes we should certainly avoid. So um, I will start with Leonid uh, and I would like Leonid to give you maybe five minutes uh, to express briefly but very clearly uh, your ideas on those two issues. What was wrong for 70 years and what should we do next 70 years? Yeah, uh, please. Um, Albert, thank you very much. Um, well, I'm not sure if it was wrong for 70 years, right? Um, we definitely got a lot of achievements in those 70 years and the breakthrough, for example, in, of course, in deep learning and the way we heard today in, in, in all our presentations, it's actually proving it. But at the same time, um, it could be that we interpreted, you know, the, the, the paper, the ideas in, in slightly um, if, if we interpreted the idea slightly differently, the story, the, the history could also be different. Because uh, for me, you know, I, I think we should start with, with this notion of intelligence, right? And um, what is intelligence? And I don't want it to be like philosophical here. I want to be very, very practical, right? And so intelligence is, you know, when I think about intelligence, it's really ability to set up and solve problems and achieve certain goals in the real world. And uh, that's it, right? And artificial intelligence, it's a computer or a program that can do it. Nowhere in this definition have I ever said uh, the word human. And so, you know, somehow, you know, going back to the Turing test, we put machines in this unfavorable positions. In order to pass Turing tests, they need to know what humans are, right? They need to know how to simulate and mimic and behave like humans. At the same time, intelligence really doesn't mean to be human. Intelligence means ability to solve, to set up and solve problems. 
And so um, I, I don't think we went in, in the wrong direction, but part of, of the effort could have been avoided in the sense of trying to make machines that exactly mimic humans. Now, while doing so, we, of course, you know, make huge interesting discoveries and um, learn a lot about humans and learn a lot about, uh, for example, human brain structure, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but in general, setting up a goal of building a machine that mimics human might not be the right goal. And going forward, I think we should focus on things like actually building machines that solve things that can set up problems and solve them and not necessarily the problems that human would be able to solve. In fact, why do we need machines to solve problems that human can solve? So we need to have machines that will solve problems that humans cannot solve. And we need to go and, and, and look in that direction more than trying to replicate humans. And though you know, humans and our brains are probably a huge you know, inspiration for computer scientists to build machines, they're insanely complex. And I think trying to reconstruct them um, in and to reconstruct, for example, continuous way the brain operates in our sort of digital binary zero ones that computers operate is probably is not going to work um, anyhow. So, bottom line, I think uh, we need to refocus a bit, um, you know, understanding intelligence as ability again to solve, to set up and solve real world problem, and uh, work into solving intelligence in this sense and not in replicating how human brains work and what us as humans can do. Thank you. Leonid, I have a question. Uh, can you give us an example of that kind of problem that humans cannot really solve without uh, totally you know, for, without example, for example, you know, genomics right now, we, a lot of things we cannot solve. We cannot, for example, map precisely genes on the, you know, genotypes on the phenotype, genes onto precisely diseases, right? Um, you know, there it might be a reason for huge huge number of possibilities, or maybe we're approaching it in the wrong way. And I think the great advantage that could come from um, AI is being able to solve the problems in a different way that we're thinking about them. That's one thing. Another thing is, I think, it, and, and as, as a professor, you perfectly know that, um, you know, solving problems when it is well posed, well positioned, well specified, I mean, when you specify the problem really well, it's not that hard to solve it. It's actually hard to formulate the problem precisely that it is solvable, right? And so if machines learn how to actually formulate problems before solving them, right, that would be a huge advantage. So, and that's what AI cannot do. Like AI cannot formulate tasks for, for AI to work on. AI cannot put any uh, actually goals. And that's a yeah. big problem uh, for artificial intelligence right now because uh, goal setting, uh, aim setting, uh, target for moving forward is the biggest problem for artificial intelligence right now. I think uh, I also wrote a paper on this too. Okay. Um, do you think, Leonid, that, uh, that um, DeepMind uh, Alpha something with uh, molecules might work for um, application AI in science? Do you think oh, wow. that's an example of uh, what you're talking about? Well, um, it's, it's actually a very good example. You're talking about the recent, uh, you know, this, the folding example, right? When, alpha when folding, the, yes. Uh, alpha folding. Um, this is actually an amazing example. And it's also, you know, I would say it's on the same level of amusement for me as, you know, GPT-3 when you interact with it. But the thing is, the truth is, you know, GPT-3 has no clue what it is talking about, right? And so it, it learned the statistics of the sequences, right? And honestly, if AlphaGo, by learning the certain statistical patterns, is, you know, can you know, manage to predict um, the right protein folding that allow us to build new, 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 for example, new medicines, that's fantastic. That's, that's, that's terrific. Does it bring us closer to like AI in terms of understanding? No. Mm -hmm. so, thank you very much. Um, so, Actually, Gary, uh, I would like you to join us in our discussion yeah. and also to elaborate on those two things. What was wrong uh, for the last 70 years in terms of our quest for artificial intelligence? And at least I know two things. You sold two startups to Google. That's a good one. But what was wrong? Uh, and what should we write uh, to make it better? You sell another one startup to Google, maybe? And something else. <laughs> Okay, can you hear me? 
Yes, excellent. Uh, okay, so um, what was wrong? Well, uh, uh, you know, early on, we we didn't actually have a lot of compute for number one. <laughs> I, I mean, our brain has a fantastic amount of compute in it, and uh, we had not. We still don't. Uh, we, we're still not at the that level. That's like. Um, uh, probably available anywhere, but um, is uh, you know we're we're getting there. So that that was one. There there was some understandings of neurology. There was also what the idea is of intelligence, what it really is. I mean, people got enamored with like logical proofs and other things, and. Um, this isn't really, you know, a, a large part. Well, a large part of what our intelligence is is simply survival as, um, you know, a simian in an environment for for whatever reason. So, you know, there were the the goal that we had set out to do was was largely wrong, like logical proofs, and and. Um, uh, we didn't have the compute to do it. We didn't have a lot of understanding. So there, there weren't kind of sort of interesting machines like robots that were I even capable, hardware or the compute. So, you know, what was wrong was like uh, too early uh, naivete. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what do we do? Um, uh, well, it, it's... Um, it's beginning to to get a little better in that, like, let's say, you know, I've been, I started my academic career in, in neural networks, and those of us working in it, like an early friend of mine was uh, uh, <laughs> um, Jan LeCun. <laughs> I contacted him when I was in graduate school because I wanted a corner detector he was working on. But, but you know, we, we were working on neural networks, and we knew that was the kind of structure, not this symbolic AI. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, but, but what we have right now is not, it, it, it's a fantastically useful tool, but I'd call it, it it's still um, basically a deep associator. It's not, it's not intelligence itself. And uh, in, intelligence itself is, is a little bit um, difficult to uh, define, but, but, uh, uh, you know, I think there's, uh, there's, um, a, 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 a right now you have to understand like what a mine is and what a mine can do and and i think there's uh, you know a lot of misconceptions there's um you know uh, can a mine live forever it's pretty clearly no not not in any not in principle like it can because a mind is built up off of structures and those structures suffer a kind of decay of uh, when you it's supposed to represent like distributions and 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 they become you know overloaded but but an example like i'm going to use in another talk is is um when you're building a robot, you have to build a mine, and the, that mine explicitly or implicitly represents um, the the world and the robot. And like you're forced to do this um, every time you do it, every time you want to make something operate in an environment. And and the very primitive ones have a very primitive model, but you know some of them that I've worked on, let's say a Stanley, which is a simple example. What it did is it it had um, sensing in a, the, the, it had various modes of sensing, lasers, GPS, wheel odometry, whatever, um, in an environment and it, 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 it and, and vision and it fused all this information into a world map. And then it, it knew the direction of gravity. And in that little world map, so it had this model of itself. It, it had the world, and the world was very simple. It was bad things, good things, and things I don't know at a tilt. <laughs> and then it ran that in a physics simulator. And like how, it, and, and, and so another thing people don't understand is that we aren't our intelligence, we're our emotions. Those are what drive you, not, uh, you know, your intelligence is a how. Uh, what is always by your emotion. So, so if you love, like, computers, uh, given a certain intellectual level, you're going to become very good at computers, if, that, if that's what you really love. 
And and so Stanley's emotion system was GPS waypoints. That's what drove it. It wanted to get from one to another safely. And, and so that was its entire mind. Its mind formed the world of bad, <laughs> bad, good, and I don't know on a... Uh, you know, on a tilt, and it knew where it wanted to go next and next and next, and it simulated itself going there, and then it, it would actually take that step in the real world. We're very much like that. You see your simulation um, when you're asleep, which I just was, <laughs> and, uh, it, it, you know, and I, I like to say when you wake up, your dreams don't stop. They they just connect to a data source, which is the world. But you look look at Stanley's mind, and 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 this is all mind, so it's a very simple mind. But um, what can it understand? All it understands is kind of like bad, good, don't know, um, <laughs> you know, direction, a world. Well, if if you wanted to explain. I, I <laughs> you know, maybe it's Dostoevsky, um, uh, uh, you know, crime and punishment, you know, what uh, this, the person takes a very ba a rash move. Well, a rash move to Stanley, if you wanted to explain this, Stanley the robot, uh, a rash move would be cutting across the I don't know land to take a shortcut to the, to, you know, not go the long way around, but jump to a further waypoint. Well, that's a, a rash move. And so you could explain Dostoevsky, you know, crime and punishment to the robot, but not really. His brain cannot um, understand this because it's not rich enough. Well, to rounding error, that's us. <laughs> <laughs> so we will never understand the world uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. under this theory, but we, we can create these self-operating agents who have a certain level and can do certain things. In the same way, if you have your cat, it will never understand, um, you know, you play it, <laughs> Dostoevsky, it will never understand it because it doesn't have. But if you could talk its language, you could say, well, it's like a kitten that doesn't listen to its mother and it's going to get in trouble. And then the cat will say, I understand. You go, no, you don't. <laughs> we're the same. Like, to rounding error, we're the same. We'll never understand the world. All we get is a model of the world, and that model is a causal model that, like Stanley, that allows us, Stanley needed to drive across the desert. We need to operate in a social simulation. We will never understand the world and physics. There'll be no final theories, because we don't even see the what needs to have a theory of it. We have none of that circuitry. And, uh, you know, so we can create these machines. When we, we can create a machine that has this interior model that socially simulates, and it will become conscious and aware and it might be more powerful for us and we could say well what's the real structure or meaning of the universe and it will say well it's it's like um a we kitten that's going in danger right we we won't be able to understand yeah. what it understands totally. after a certain level yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I totally agree with the last point we will not be able to understand the machine conscious machine if uh, they will ever be conscious uh, at that point, um, I would like probably to return to one of my slides which I um, prepared for our talk. Uh, please uh, bring up uh, this slide which I uh, selected. I don't know if you see it. Can you? Um, I the Turing continuum. Yes, Turing continuum. So uh, I actually thought about it uh, for a while and um, I, dis I, I think that Turing continuum consists of uh, uh, Turing himself um, was uh, working on very noble things like solving mathematical tasks. And by the way, our uh, our listeners, our viewers, please uh, get QR code and answer my question. Uh, going back to Turing, um, uh, Turing continuum is from virtual world to physical world and from non-verbal interaction to verbal interaction. And Turing was concentrating on the left upper corner of this, with this noble task of solving mathematical tasks, cryptography, talking, playing chess, learning languages, whatever gentlemen are um, doing. But uh, he gave no attention to the physical world because he considered it too complicated uh, for realizing in robotics. And I think that um, what, what I heard in Goody talk before and what I heard right now in Gary talk, 
uh, that uh, physical world and interaction with physical world in a verbal and non-verbal way is might hold the key uh, to creating thinking machine. Uh, it's uh, maybe an arguable position, and uh, of course you can argue with this. But uh, uh, Gary, uh, I would like uh, a little bit you to elaborate on very briefly, uh, but very clearly. Please excuse us that late night in the United States. Uh, what? <laughs> That's what, early morning. <laughs> what, what, we, uh, what we should avoid uh, and be very careful in exploration of possibilities which is, uh, artificial intelligence is creating for us. What we should be avoiding for the next 70 years? What is dangerous? Uh, and I, I think what's dangerous is not going fast enough with AI. I think um, human humanities. <laughs> um, well, humanity's existence depends on uh, the survival depends on getting these techniques fast for design and and. Um, whatever I, I i'm not one of these that that's worried about that ai is going to kill us i'm worried on the other side that we're not doing it fast enough um also i'm not worried that if ai that ai will kill us we're a technology the, the primary thing of our species is we create te technologies if that's not stable and survivable so what then we die that was what nature intended because that's what we do uh, and yet like we can't we can't shy back from this we have to accelerate it um, in my view and I'm, I'm not really worried also if ai turns on us and decides to destroy us well then we succeeded right we created another species that can live without us um you know that'll be our greatest day um I, so i'm on the total opposite side of this like we should be applying much more efforts and funding and acceleration and just go go all out uh you know we need the robots the human labor is failing around the world it's not there's not a population problem there's an underpopulation problem that's rapidly going to hit us I mean, yeah, it's going to hit. Here. <laughs> yeah, it's it's going to hit us like a freight train, and we need we need the labor, we need the AI's ability to solve environmental problems, and, uh, global warming problems, energy problems. Like we just cannot go fast enough. Thank you very much, Gary. Yep. Um, okay, uh, I'm going. Uh, please bring us my slide with uh, tune continuum. Is it possible? Uh, uh, that for me to bring it up, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's already. Uh, I, I, I have it. it. No, 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 Gary, it's it's all right. So say, thank you very it, much, Gary. Yeah. Um, nope. uh, and uh, chewing continuum also allows us to do one thing. It's uh, uh, I sort out all possible chewing tests uh, around this chewing continuum, and you can see that. Uh, all Turing tests which created for the last 70 years are a uh, group in uh, upper left corner and almost nothing in physical world and non-verbal interaction, which is also very important uh, because uh, dark matter of culture is what is our, uh, I would say, non-verbal interaction might be as important as verbal interaction, chatbots and um, some, some other things. Um, also, please... Uh, take some time to to answer my question so um, and I would like to go to Gurdip Pal. Uh, Gurdip uh, I listened to your presentation uh, I, as careful as I could uh, in terms of the, uh, I'm also one of organizers of my AI journey uh, and I know that Microsoft is betting on GPT-3 it's uh, good to know that uh, but that's we also know for sure, and uh, I think uh, Gary mentioned it a little bit, that uh, GPT-3 is at least not energy efficient, as well as all other frameworks uh, in terms of, uh, I would say, chatbots, um, computer vision. So uh, my mind right now is consuming only 25 watts of uh, uh, energy. And I'm extremely, I'm not that smart as GPT-3 maybe, but I'm extremely energy efficient. 
So uh, for today, I have only one cup of coffee and it's just enough for me to run all day. And robots need a battery uh, replaced maybe uh, eight hours, at least in our Sberbank mobile robots uh, need robot uh, battery replaced quite often. So, um, Gurdip, uh, do you think that uh, this bottleneck, energy bottleneck, is a very serious bottleneck for the next uh, 70 years of development of artificial intelligence. Um, those GPT-13 will be ever be energy efficient as human. And of course, you can also help us to elaborate what was wrong for the last 70 years. So, uh -huh. it, please. Great. So, um, you know, I was uh, uh, thinking about your question about the last 70 years, and, you know, I would say that you know, humans are very resourceful creatures. And we approached, after, you know, the Alan Turing uh, famous paper, we approached artificial intelligence in a very resourceful manner as well. Now, you know, what I mean by that is that, you know, we, we basically immediately looked at the problem and said, you know, we understand logic, we understand rules. So we took, you know, that <laughs> bit and we ran with it. And then we realized, well, we can only get this far with artificial intelligence with this sort of rules-based approach. Then, you know, things sort of quietened down. And then we realized, well, we know math pretty well. So let's start using, you know, some of these math-based techniques, you know, k-nearest neighbor, some of the clustering uh, approaches, and, you know, sort of this classic data-driven ma uh, machine learning uh, came about. Sorry, so I was saying, you know, so we're pretty resourceful creatures and and now because there is so much digitized data and there is so much compute, uh, of course, you know, we are leaning heavily on, on, on deep learning methods. And, you know, GPT-3, I completely agree with you, is uh, it reminds me of this expression, more thrust Scotty, which is basically, you know, saying that, uh, you know, let's throw more and more at it in terms of compute and data. And of course, the performance is going to get better. Um, I, you know, so so that sort of, I think, has been the, sort of the journey of the last 70 years. But obviously, this is not a sustainable model as well. And I think that uh, if there is one thing I would look at sort of critically in the last 70 years is that you know, we tend to get obsessed in the community with one method or the other. Um, you know, and, and we go through these different waves, and right now we are in the deep learning wave, which, you know, I'm a huge fan of. And, you know, I think as Gary said, you know, it's a deep learning and the, these neural network architectures are great function approximators. But uh, we have to, you know, take a step back and say, you know, what are the big gaps that exist and are we making sufficient progress in addressing those gaps uh, versus, you know, just pushing forward with more more energy and, you know, more data. And I think, you know, in my, uh, 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 towards my one of my last slides, I talked about some of the areas we need to make progress on, you know, specifically with the area of uh, power consumption. You know, I think that, uh, you know, since we are inspired by the brain, let's look at the human brain and see, you know, how uh, it deals with, uh, you know, so works so efficiently. And I think part of it is that it is actually reasoning uh, with a lot of these sort of what we could call model-based approaches, um, where it doesn't need a lot of data to understand that if I throw an object up, it's going to come down because it has fundamental notions of physics. Um, similarly, you know, I think, you know, some of the sparse network based approaches are something that, um, you know, I think are, are pretty important that I think we need to pay attention to, you know, just because we have power doesn't mean we should, you know, go waste it. Um, you know, the human brain, for example, does amazing things uh, even on power uh, with things like heavy and sort of learning. And, you know, when it finds like two adjacent neurons firing, it, it sort of short circuits them. Um, so I think that, um, you know, certainly we should be impressed by GPT-3, but I think it is just a very small stop on a very long journey. And we need to always keep these things in perspective that, you know, what are we really trying to solve for? What are we optimizing for? As I, you know, as I said earlier in the talk, uh, I think if we define that clearly, uh, I think the next 70 years we will make tremendous progress. Um, 
So, uh, uh, I have a question for Gurdi, but it might be go later. Um, right now, uh, there is a famous saying of Mark Anderson uh, on software is the world. So, probably everybody heard of it. It means every engineering complexity is sooner or later defined by software and actually a universal Turing machine. But uh, for us, is actually uh, software uh, is not only one uh, one this uh, one part of equation, because software eats robot for breakfast, culture for lunch, and knowledge for dinner. So software is actually uh, it's everything, uh, including culture, including knowledge, and uh, everybody knows that. Um, Deep, uh, uh, Kasparov lost to computer uh, in 1997, um, and it was kind of beginning of uh, victories uh, for computers and artificial intelligence in board games. Even they were, they were playing board games a little bit earlier, but in 1997, it was not a computer who was playing against Kasparov. It was the chess culture, which was accumulated in that uh, IBM computer, uh, who was playing again against uh, Kasparov. And uh, in, 19, uh, in 2018, it was Go culture, rules of Go, uh, matches which uh, AlphaGo Zero playing, played against each other, which were, was uh, kind of uh, playing against Lissidol. So, um, and uh, I believe that um, we have uh, time when our artificial intelligence systems can just accumulate our culture, make a huge, uh, huge storage of everything we say, everything we do, and then uh, sort it out and then make a response, a response uh, and also our questions based on the whole humanity history. Uh, so um, now I'm going to you, Michael, and uh, actually uh, I remember something similar in your book, uh, which you wrote on uh, limits of artificial intelligence right now, uh, but uh, not going to your book, but going to uh, my two original questions. I would like to say, what was wrong for the last 70 years? By the way, what is the distance between Oxford and Cambridge? About 60 miles. 60 miles. Well, that's oh. the, phys the physical distance. The emotional yes. distance is far, far greater than that. Yeah, yeah I understand very well this. Uh, um, uh, by the way, about emotional distance, I have the same uh, situation in Scotland where I graduated. And uh, we, said, we usually say that uh, funerals in Glasgow, a lot of marriages and Edinburgh marriage. Well, yes, emotional distance might be more, but uh, it, uh, I, I saw that Alan Turing was running distance something like 15 miles almost every week. So it's uh, um, maybe a quarter or something of uh, distance between Cambridge and Oxford. Uh, you are from Oxford and um, Alan Turing was from Cambridge. So this emotional distance between uh, two schools are actually quite, quite important right now. Uh, but uh, going back to the question, what was wrong um, for the last 70 years except the fact that Alan Turing from, from, from Cambridge? <laughs> uh, so I think there's a, there's a couple of things, and I think uh, my answer will resonate with what Gary said and uh, and, and 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 others uh, uh, today. So the first thing is, I think there's an obsession in AI historically with discovering one idea and thinking that one idea, that one technique, is going to be a magic ingredient which takes you all the way. And so, as as as, as you said, uh, Albert, as, as Gary said, I mean, for a long time, it was the idea that knowledge, knowledge representation, we just write, we need the right way to find human knowledge and to write that down. And if we can just give that to machines, um, then that will take us all the way. So, I mean, there was a famous experiment, the psych experiment, where they tried to code up the entirety of human consensus knowledge. And the idea was, if you could give that to a machine, then, you know, AI would, would be solved. So it's that idea that there's one kind of, one single technique, you know, we have one advance and wow, this is it, this is the magic ingredient and that's going to take us all the way. And it doesn't, right? I mean, it just doesn't. Um, and I guess 
I'm I'm very I'm hugely impressed as I'm impressed as anybody is by the current advances in AI, the things that are going on in deep learning. These are real and they're cause for excitement. I mean, I think they are real advances, but they are narrow advances and they are ingredients, but they're not the whole ingredient. They're not going to take us the entirety of the way to um, to artificial intelligence. So I think that's the first thing. That's the first lesson. Right. Don't imagine that there's one single ingredient which is going to take you all the way. Um, second, I think this is quite interesting, the examples we've seen in the example on your slide, things like chess and Go, those, why, why do AI researchers study problems like chess and Go and proving mathematical theorems? They do it because those are the things that they regard as requiring intelligence, as requiring genius, right? Those, you know, being a good mathematician is something that, you know, lots of computer scientists aspire to be. So they look at those problems and they say, well, if we can solve, you know, if we can prove mathematical theorems with a computer, then we must have solved the intelligence problem. But actually, the truth is, that's not where a lot of the hard problems are. So to go back to the driverless car problem that Gary uh, was, was talking about earlier, and I'd be interested to see whether Gary disagrees with me or not. What is the hard problem in, in dri driverless cars? Is it knowing whether to speed up or slow down or to turn left or to turn your indicators on? No, I don't think so. The problems with driverless cars are knowing where you are and what's around you, what's going on in your environment. Right. All of the problems that my guess anyway is that Gary and his team had to solve back in 2005 were to do with perceiving your environment. If you have all that information, then knowing whether to speed up or slow down and so on is going to be is going to be easy. Actually, that's that part of it, I think, is a relatively straightforward and conventional bit of computer code. Um, so perception, and actually that's where neural networks, the current wave of AI technology, that, that's where it's turned out to be very, very good at dealing with problems related to perception, understanding pro you know, problems in computer vision, uh, you know, in understanding speech and so on. Uh, these were fearsomely difficult problems, and that's where that technology has proved to be very, very successful. And the third thing I think uh, that uh, the, the third historical mistake is not understanding that where the difficult problems are is the world. Right. Um, we have evolved over billions of years to succeed in inhabiting uh, the physical environment that we inhabit, the planet Earth and the narrow bit of planet Earth that we do actually uh, inhabit. Imagining that, you know, you can you can build a neural network and train it up in the lab, you know, over over a couple of days and that that's going to be as good at dealing with the world as we are, I think is just a huge, huge, huge uh, mistake. So the world is really, really important. Let's go back to GPT-3. So what is GPT-3? GPT-3 is this program developed by OpenAI, I believe, and it was trained by uh, giving this program huge numbers of texts, vast amounts of written texts. So let's take an example, something that you might want to do, something that Gary might want to do when the, uh, for breakfast, is make an omelet, right? Um, completely routine task for a human being, making an omelet. So GPT-3 has read every omelet recipe that's ever been written, right? It's, there's no recipe for an omelet out there. It's written every, it's read every essay about omelets. It's probably read books about omelets. So in terms of just knowledge, it must surely have all the knowledge about, uh, about omelets that there exists in the world. But could it make an omelette? No, of course it couldn't. It doesn't know anything about omelettes because omelettes are things that exist in the real world. For it, omelette is just a symbol that it's seen time and time again in these huge numbers of repositories that have been thrown at it. None of that knowledge that is coded into GPT-3, none of that stuff is actually grounded uh, in any experience of the world that we all have. For me, the word omelette represents every experience I've ever had with an omelette, every omelette I've ever tried to make, every egg that I've ever tried to break to go into an omelette, every successful and bad omelette. It reminds me of an omelette I had in Paris in 1997 and so on. Right. In that sense, the concept of omelette means something to me because it's grounded in my experiences with the world. 
GPT-3 doesn't have any experience of the world to ground itself in. So in that respect, it's just a disembodied, I mean, it's a very, to be clear, it's an incredibly impressive feat of engineering and people will do really, really cool things with it, but it doesn't understand, I think, just to reiterate the point. And I say it doesn't understand because it can't. It doesn't have any experience of the world. So those are the three things I think where, you know, this obsessing on one idea and imagining that there's one single technique which is going to take you to kind of the holy grail of AI, that's a mistake. Um, focusing on problems which actually you might find impressive as requiring intelligence in people, but actually is not where the real hard problems are. I think that historically has been a mistake. And finally, not realizing the importance of dealing with the world. You know, experience, human experience, human knowledge, everything about the human condition is grounded in our experiences uh, in the human world. And I think to if we ever succeed in building machines that are self-aware and conscious and sentient and all of those things, machines that have understanding, then that understanding will have to be grounded in the world in the same way. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. So going back to, um, uh, to some ideas which I said before that you see Alan Turing, I don't know if you see this uh, slide, uh, but Alan Turing said that board games, uh, talking is very important for artificial intelligence. But he said that there is uh, real human pleasures, food, sport and sex. And uh, those are very important actually for understanding the world, exactly as you, Michael, say, said. Um, so I think that without uh, understanding those three, uh, we will not have any intelligence at all. Um, and at that point, uh, I'm going back to Gurdjieff because I was asking a question on uh, the role of embodied intelligence and robotics. Uh, in for uh, Is it important for the future research in artificial intelligence, Gurdjieff? Uh, together, uh, Sber and Microsoft Research did wonderful projects for using reinforcement learning in robotics. Uh, then I would like to pose this question uh, now openly uh, to anybody who would like to answer this, Leonid, Gary, uh, Michael. But uh, my question is, how important embodied intelligence to study uh, perception, cognition, machines, and how important uh, it for uh, research uh, of uh, general intel artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence uh, with specific applications. So, uh, can we create artificial intelligence with no embodiment, or we really need embodied machines uh, to advance fully in that direction? So, who would like to answer this question? Leonid, uh, Michael. Michael. Oh, okay. Uh, Leonid first, then Mike, please. Okay. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be short. Um, I actually want to, you know, support Michael in this in the sense that. In order to build, like you know, truly artificial intelligence, machines should gain the experience that human has, right? And what's the best way to gain an experience than to explore the world? And to explore the world and to do it autonomously, yes, you need to have those type of systems, those embedded systems with intelligence. And uh, you know, when when you when you see when you look at the, for example, at the robot dogs running around, right? In, outside Boston, uh, you realize that we're actually pretty close to the to the phase where uh, the systems will be exploring world on their own, gaining the experience, learning what omelet is eventually, and hopefully we'll will not only read about it but try it. Thank you. We will we will soon surprise uh, have some surprise with robot dogs around there, mm -hmm. but. We should be very patient in this. Michael, please. Yeah, so I'm going to bring in a slightly different sort of aspect to this problem. So there's a famous, um, there's a famous six-word um, exchange that was formulated by um, Stephen Pinker, the psychologist and linguist, and it goes like this. So Bob says, I'm leaving you, and yeah. Anne says, who is she? Um, so there's six words, right? 
And everybody who hears those six words immediately has a rich mental picture of what's going on. As, as people, we all understand that, right? Maybe somebody listening to this actually just lived it last night. I'm very sorry if that's the case. Um, so what's going on there? How do we understand that? We understand that because we've got experience of the human world, right? We understand about human relationships, human beliefs, human desires, and so on. And nobody trained us in that. That's just our experience as human beings living as social animals that have relationships with people in the human world. Now, this is, a, this is a big problem for AI. If AI, you know, suppose you're on the, you're talking on the telephone to, uh, to, a, to, to an AI system which decides whether you get a loan or not, and, uh, and it says, no, you're not going to have a loan, it must surely be, if it's going to be any use, it has to be able to understand that this is going to make you upset or angry uh, and so on. I mean, an AI system that would, de that would be a doctor, right, an AI system that took the place of a human doctor would have to be able to understand the intricacies of human relationships because being a doctor is not just knowing about diseases and illnesses, it's knowing about people. And the lengthy training process that doctors go through is every bit as much about training them to deal with people and to understand the people that they're dealing with and what kind of treatment regimes are going to work for them and so on as as individuals understanding about their personal circumstances their relationships you know all of that kind of stuff so we all have that because we've been trained both genetically through billions of years of evolution and since birth, right, uh, where, um, you know, where our parents teach us right from wrong and so on and teach us about what's acceptable in relationships and, and, and so on. We all learn about that because we're part of the human world. How are we going to give that stuff to machines? I think it's a big, I mean, technically it's called theory of mind, right? How are we going to give machines a theory of mind so we can, they can understand what that six word dialogue means. I'm leaving you, who is she? Some, sometimes I also don't know who is she, yes. You know, for I'm I'm unclear whether embodiment again. There's many kinds of mind, right? And and so, um, but you know, I'm unclear to the extent of of um, you know, we 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 can be disembodied, but embodied in a virtual world, right? <laughs> so, uh, you know, it can all be happening in a cloud. But but I do think embodiment does give you. Um, certain like uh, things that w which are primary to us, like the the fear of death and the need to survive, and that's a lot of what oh, we're we're right. the, the, that's a lot of what we're based on, and it, it, and so we form this causal model that's necessary for our existence, and then we press that causal that causal model. For everything else, we think we understand, um, and and uh, so if we want AIs that are intelligences that are going to be useful to us, they must share certain like embodiments and you know the same kinds of things that we do, and it's unclear, um, you know, this how much a a, a giant body of associations. It, it, it like GDP it, three. It, it, it's kind of shocking how far it can carry you, and yet there's like no soul in the in the structure. It's just a chain of of associations, right? Between and 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 so you can it it has all these brittle points and unexpected um, failures uh, that are hard to predict. Versus, you know, with us, we're, we're kind of regularized in our environment by our physical, <laughs> you know, need to uh, understanding of how we would get damaged, how we would survive. What's particular with humans is a large part of our mind is devoted to a social world, which is what we created. And so we're always modeling our place in the social world and how to interact and survive with other entities in it and and that's that's a, a very key thing for us in fact it is a large amount of our whole brain and understanding and again you see this social world in your dreams y you fully simulate other people and your interaction and your hierarchical place with them in your dreams and so a large part of our mind is devoted to that and 
and and so to that extent, like uh, I, I think, like if we want robot, I mean, if we want intelligences. They have to sort of be embodied with us, and it, it, you know, if we if if we want them for the human mm-hmm. factors, there are many things like protein folding and whatever that are a very specialized area, and yeah, we want <laughs> we just want a machine to do that. Again, such a machine really needs to em- explicitly or implicitly embody a, a kind of internal causal model of folding if we really want it not to just be associational, to sort of mostly like sh- getting a lot of stuff right, but not really fundamentally understanding the 3D chemical world that these things are in, it, it would just be a kind of weird associational manifold over chemistry without the sort of physics and the causal physics that it really needs to understand it. So um, th- so in that sense, it, it should embody a causal model of the world upon which it, it grounds its meaning. And, and that's what GDP3 lacks. It, it lacks yeah. any of this grounding of meaning, right? So, any model lacks, actually. Yes. But, but, but uh, you know, it, it's not that the problem isn't that models lack this. It's that you, you want a model that spans your space because we're always going to lack. Like, there is no super intelligence that, that – can know everything and every aspect. It's always going to be grounded to a causal situation. And when you try to go too far out of that, it's just going to break. It won't, you won't be able to expand this mine indefinitely. It will be based and built upon a causal structure, and that will be its limits forever. <laughs> you need a new mine to, to go into some completely new area. But... Um, I could write books about this, but... <laughs> yes, please um, do. <laughs> I might. <laughs> okay. So, you see, uh, now, um, I, I actually, before, I uh, kind of knew that uh, our discussion will go this way. So, uh, this slide is summarized three ways uh, to build artificial general intelligence. First one we discussed a lot is uh, representation of a symbolic approach to the description of the world. S- uh, second is connectionism based on basically uh, neural networks, deep learning neural networks. And the third one is uh, embodied intelligence and a kind of combination of uh, maybe two of these robots. So uh, I would like briefly to uh, any of you ask uh, which, um, which approach you believe the most? M- or might be none, and there is a fourth approach, or maybe only combination of all three will bring us forward. So uh, I'll start with Leonid with you, and then Gary, and then Michael, please. Uh, what is the right. most important approach here? Um, to me right now, the, the, the most nearest future is, is um, I believe, li- lies in this neurosymbolic computations, right? So, which is in some sense connecting symbolic representation and connectionism. And to me, that's probably where the next advances will happen. And that's the sort of, I think, the, the most fruitful direction for the near future. Going forward, yes, embodiment definitely will join to actually gain those experience and, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the meaning and understanding of the world around us, physical world. Yes, uh, I think you are in line with Alan, what uh, Alan Turing said, because he said uh, robots are very important uh, for future development of um, thinking machine, but they're not ready here to be built here because there is no spare parts for them, and uh, it's not very clear how to feed them. Uh, Gary, please. Uh, well, I, uh, you know, for AGI, I, I, first of all, I don't believe in AGI. It's ASI, a specific intelligence. I don't think we have a general intelligence because we use our internal uh, structures to extend to like what is a quanta, you know, what is a particle. It goes as a wave and a particle down at the small scale. It does not. It, that's just where our metaphor that we have for our brain breaks down. And and so I, I do think you need all of these things. I think the, the, the symbolic representations 
derive from from this this kind of this necessity to build a world model for yourself and and it, it it's those parts that give you the symbols again like this would extend to people think well math is universal and i go no no math only exists in here it's not a property of the world it's a human property <clears throat> and it exists in the human mind and it works for our models uh, but it, but it's not some magical thing that existed out in the universe that we tap into. It, it's a structure that works in our causal models, and it breaks down. Like most of math is unknowable to us. Like most things, the the vast majority of the universe is unexpressible by by <laughs> even unknowable by our functions and symbols. Right, but causally at our scale at our time um we have a, a very flexible model that can extend so uh, you know the, the quick answer is we need all these things and it, they'll always be uh, relative to the job we want it to solve so uh, to achieve artificial specific intelligence you know that can be do very general tasks but there's no such thing as this universal intelligence it's always in terms of La learn grounded models, in my opinion. <laughs> Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, Michael, please. Yeah, so like Gary, I am a skeptic about AGI, and I don't see anything on the table at the moment which is which is going to take us to uh, to AGI. I think all of those things are important. Uh, uh, connectionism, symbolic representations. I mean, I think it's pretty widely accepted now that. Um, Symbolic approaches and connectionism, I think, need to talk to each other. Um, I don't think the symbolic approaches that were popular 30 years ago are likely to be the way forward. So I don't think that's going to be it. But there will be some form of um, symbolic reasoning that's, that's, that's got to go on. And I think what I would say is uh, the reason I'm a skeptic about AGI is that... Um, Again, going back to a point I made earlier, you know, we are the product of billions of years of reinforcement learning with thousands of generations of our ancestors uh, where Mother Nature has tuned us over that immense period of time to be able to be uh, generally intelligent in the world that we're in. The current techniques, you know, the headline techniques like AlphaGo and the chess playing programs that are so successful and, and so on, these are all based on reinforcement learning where a program just experiments and gets feedback. It tries to do something, it does badly in, in, a, in a computer game, for example, right? a computer game like um, Space Invaders. Um, so you, you can have a program which learns to play the game of Space Invaders, but actually it does that by just essentially starting by moving randomly, seeing what works and what doesn't work. And when something works, when it gets a good score, it does that again. That's reinforcement learning. It's just, just over time playing and playing and playing it. The problem is reinforcement learning doesn't work in the real world. Gary couldn't have used reinforcement learning to train his cars in 2005, right? Because they would have got through a great many cars. These cars wouldn't have gone anywhere. Reinforcement learning doesn't work. The kind of reinforcement learning which is so successful in games, for example, virtual environments, is very, very successful there, but doesn't work in the real world. Um, so I'm somewhat of a skeptic about AGI for that reason. I mean, the, we are the product of reinforcement learning, but it's billions of years of evolution which have given us a kind of reinforcement learning to generate uh, human beings that can uh, that can successfully occupy uh, the human world. Um, in Sberbank, we recently published a book. Um, probably half of authors of this book are presenting on this uh, conference. And it says in Russian, um, strong artificial intelligence. And actually, the book was written on uh, artificial general intelligence, AGI. Um, well, not, not, not to go deep into the story, but uh, we uh, here we are actually putting a lot of efforts in uh, understanding how to advance science uh, further on. And I think our discussion um, for, like, like we just had before, uh, is a very important step on uh, n not only advancing uh, artificial intelligence research in general, but also finding bridges between our communities here in Russia, United States, uh, England, Great Britain. Uh, and I think that it's very important for us to listen to 
um, and especially in the conditions that we cannot travel, we cannot go to our countries to visit us. And believe me, Gary and Michael, you will not uh, regret if you come to Russia and enjoy. <laughs> Gary been here quite a few times uh, with us, visit us, and uh, we always like to uh, welcome you here. But Michael, uh, when you have time, Certainly, you should uh, visit us and you will enjoy staying uh, in Russia, in Moscow, and visiting Sperbank Laboratories, which quite a few of them. And I'm sure Leonid will uh, join uh, this invitation and extend to um, all of you. I will remember that invitation. Yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. We, we, we love guests here. Um, so, uh, I hope that uh, pandemic and COVID will uh, finish uh, quite soon and we will have an opportunity to travel uh, to each other and uh, also to send our researchers to study with each other because we welcome your researchers here uh, to study with us and to do research and I'm sure that our researchers will be uh, more than happy to visit uh, Britain, uh, United States. Uh, in robotics laboratory, we have uh, five people visiting Microsoft Research and for almost half a year studying there. Uh, artificial intelligence and reinforcement learning uh, and applications is to robotics. So Gurdip is not with us, so he's, he's, uh, he, he will not tell us about it, but I'm sure that uh, my colleagues uh, from robotics laboratory are explaining uh, in the sections um, for this conference. So, um, I would like to summarize uh, what we said today. And uh, the general idea uh, which we just discussed is that um, we need all three approaches for building artificial general intelligence, strong artificial intelligence, symbolic approach, connectionism approach, embodied approach, but the phases of this might be different. So it might be all together, or it might be first approach where we combine best parts of symbolic and connectionism together to build a very solid foundation, as Leonid uh, said before. Uh, so uh, the one thing which Mike uh, also said very important to us is that we should not focus on only one thing. Uh, many years ago, Chinese leader Mao Zedong said 100 flowers should blossom. So probably for artificial intelligence, we need more than 100 flowers. And uh, we need more than 100 speakers. And uh, we also need uh, to exchange embodied approach and make uh, conference great again. So thank you very much for spending time with us. And I would like to uh, thank you all our um, visitors, all our listeners, viewers, uh, which uh, I'm sorry for technical troubles. I'm sorry to all of you. You'll be patient. Our guests were patient. And I have wonderful team. And I hope that next year uh, we'll have you and maybe some other excellent speakers for my panel where we discuss something else. I don't know what. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.